used your own data and your own paper, which really wasn't looking at specifically laminal laminal plasty versus laminal fusion. I think it was just looking at anterior versus posterior, wasn't it? Well, well, I think the primary outcomes were for anterior versus posterior. But in any event, these are my disclosures, none of which are relevant. This is what we're talking about. We're talking about the most common cause of spastic paraparesis, right? Myelopathy. These patients present with beta abnormalities, neck pain, typically radicular arm pain, hand dysfunction, bowel bladder dysfunction, and obviously causes a significant disability for the patients. And the goals of our procedure is to halt the progression, to place the spinal cord in a good environment so the, so the symptoms will improve, alleviate a component of their neck pain when pretty much it, 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 it's present uh, when you have a cervical degenerative process. Everybody's complaining, at least in my experience, of some degree of neck discomfort and pain. We want to maintain their cervical alignment. We just had a whole session on cervical deformity and not creating cervical deformity. And we want, obviously want to lead surgical morbidity and complications. We want to preserve their long-term outcome. And to this point, we want to get them back to work, right? And if you do a laminoplasty versus laminectomy infusion, and you say, well, you had a fusion, so you are restricted from going back to work. Of course, the data is going to support you in the laminal test you do, where you didn't restrict them because you weren't concerned about them doing some harm. But we, with our laminectomy infusions, we give them no restrictions post up with regards to return to work status compared to our laminectomy patients. We all know that decompression anterior versus posterior with mild, moderate, to severe myelopathy, patients do well with regards to the neurologic outcome. And selecting the appropriate outcome. It's determined by the location of the pathology, the alignment of the cervical spine, the number of levels, the degree of axial pain, instability, inflammatory arthropathy, their occupation plays a role, and obviously, surgeon's experience. And there's an absolute contraindication in the kyphotic spine to performing a posterior directed procedure. So, our options in these multi level cases are obviously the cervical laminoplasty versus the right answer is cervical laminectomy infusion. And this is the thing's not here, but this is other areas. And this is your ex girlfriend, not from Jefferson, to be able to send me a picture. Uh, but with the growing population, we're going to be faced with these cases, and, and clearly it's going to be a burden for, for us all. So, why would I do this? Why would I do a laminal plasty? Is an operation looking for an indication? I would say that somebody that comes to your office that has no neck pain, no radicular arm pain associated with the myelopathy, that's a rare bird, at least in my, in my patient population. Rarely do I see somebody that presents with cervical myelopathy with no neck pain or minimal neck pain, no radicular arm pain um, uh, with a, a spondylotic spine. So that's a rare bird, I, I would say. So, so if you're a, a careful, if you're a compassionate, if you're a caring physician, which I know you are, but you will consider doing a laminectomy infusion. And you already brought this up. 70% of the academic institutions across the United States, they prefer laminectomy infusion compared to laminoplasty. As Joe pointed out, patient selection is key, right? And in all full disclosure, this is a 50-year-old uh, patient who's an electrician. He really has very minimal neck pain. He has congenital canal stenosis. I offered him a laminoplasty, right? He has great range of motion. It's a three-year outcome. He's moving and he's clinically doing well. We just had an entire session looking at cervical lordosis. Isn't it important? We know that the loss of sagittal plane Cobb angle is associated with a higher degree of neck pain, and that happens greater in laminal plasty. What about a meta-analysis? Right? There's always a trend towards preservation of cervical lordosis in the meta-analysis for laminectomy infusion. And when you look at some of the prospective multi-centered AO studies, laminectomy infusion resulted in preserved cervical lordosis and fewer axial neck pain. And by the way, the length of stay in this international group was greater in the laminoplasty, and they even put more laminoplasty patients in the ICU, according to that data. And John Rhea, I think he's around here somewhere. I saw him right in the back. There's John, right? And if you look at our president's data, right? Significant improvement of neck pain after laminectomy infusion. No improvement in neck pain after laminoplasty, right? Significant loss of lordosis, John found, with laminoplasty compared to laminectomy infusion. Significant increase in cervical SPA, laminoplasty versus laminectomy infusion. So even John, our president, admitted laminoplasty is only a treatment option in a limited subset of patients. What about patients with instability patterns, right? If you have several patients that are in two and a half, three millimeters, this is not an uncommon problem that we all see, 
Like those patients did worse from an actual neck pain perspective. John Ratcliffe looked at 2,500 patients, 22 to 50 percent incidence of worsening alignment, 15 percent incidence of kyphosis with laminoplasty procedures. Right? Our colleague from Asia Pacific who championed laminoplasty. Right? Axial neck pain before 60 percent. Axial neck pain after their laminoplasty 82 percent. And by the way. 50% tell us that it's all day long that they're having neck pain. What about a procedure that is motion sparing? Well, there's data to support that if you do a laminoplasty, is it a motion maintaining operation? Well, in this study, motion decreased by almost 25%. We know that laminectomy infusion, long term, 10 year results, preserved cervical ergosis, and 10 years fewer neck symptoms compared to laminoplasty. What about patients that have OPLL or spondylosis? Well, in laminectomy infusion, if you look at the data, those, <coughs> those osteophytes will resorb as opposed to in laminoplasties. Patients that have OPLL, there's a 3% risk of having reoperation in laminoplasty, of which 50% of them were due to neurologic deterioration. So you've got to be very careful in the laminoplasty patients. What about complications? And Bill brought this up. Right, when you look at the cohort, neurologic improvement is about the same. Complication rate arguably is, is probably about the same. There are some studies to suggest that laminoplasty has a trend towards higher complication rate, but this is really hasn't been burdened down. Right? The positioning problems exist with both laminoplasty and laminectomy infusion. Right? But if you properly position the patient that's getting fused, and you, we do a sandwich flip patient on an OSI table, we make sure that their occiput is above their thoracic apex. We check the lateral cervical x-ray to make sure they're properly positioned. Like, that's a good way of making sure that you don't fuse them in a tectonic position. What about T5 nerve root palsy? Well, when you look at some of the data, and this is one of these studies is from Dan Rue, I don't know if he's still here. Essentially, T5 palsy, although there's certain studies that suggest that it's higher with laminectomy infusions, overall, in meta-analysis, it's probably about the same. What about our fixation, right? It's a danger to fixation. Joe didn't bring this up, but I will. Lateral mastication, pedicle screw fixation, and the cervical thoracic spine, safe and effective low risk. So, once again, why would you ever, ever do a laminoplasty? So, you are a caring, concerned, compassionate physician. I know you are. I don't like patients that complain of neck pain. I don't like patients that have loss of alignment. I don't like motion preserving operations that lead to loss of motion, right? I don't like manipulating my surgical tools and instrumenting around an open spinal canal where the spinal cord is. And I don't, and I, so I don't really like laminoplasty. So, conclusion, right? You have to choose, and Joe brought this up, you have to choose your patient's wisely, right? You need to understand the issues that occur, right, with the choice of the procedure that you choose. You need to study your own results, complications, Etc. and you need to change the procedure for the patient. So in this 63-year-old patient, everybody in this room has seen this patient. Fail conservative management has a subjective acknowledgement of declining the level of function with myelopathy, right? Determine your treatment goals, right? You want to decompress, you want to stabilize and realign them, you want to <clears throat> make sure that their pain is under control, minimal morbidity, maximal, <clears throat> maximal endurance, a posterior cervical, laminectomy instrumentation infusion achieves all your operative goals. It's simple, it's safe, it's fast, it's effective compared to laminoplasty. Thank you so much.